Hey everyone, it's Eric, and this is Strong Medicine's Intern Crash Course. Today, I'm going over 12 words you should never use in the hospital. The language we choose to use, and which we hear others use in the hospital, impacts how we think about patients. The effect may be subtle, and is usually subconscious, but it's real and cumulative. Over time, even small, seemingly harmless word choices can gradually make us less empathetic and more cynical. And my apologies in advance if this video comes across a little bit negative. After all, it's going to be me stating, don't say such and such, 12 times in a row. Let me start with two words that are really common and therefore feel really innocuous. Endorse and deny. As in, the patient endorses diarrhea, but denies abdominal pain. I don't know how these words became commonplace in medicine, but they really don't make sense. First, using the word endorse to mean report the presence of a symptom, that's, that's just not a usage of the word that's similar to how it's used in other interactions we have in our daily lives. And the word deny to mean report the absence of a symptom suddenly suggests the possibility that the patient is being untruthful. Like if a resident stated that, quote, Dr. Strong denies eating the last cookie in the team room. Instead of endorse or deny, keep it simple and objective. For example, the patient reports the presence of diarrhea and the absence of abdominal pain. The next word to never say, one which is less innocuous, is refuse, as in, the patient refused a cerebral angiogram to characterize their aneurysm. The use of the word refuse in this context is patronizing. Patients don't refuse treatments, they decline them, preferably after a shared decision-making conversation with their doctors. A possible exception here is when a patient has a life-threatening problem and declines an intervention with an extremely favorable risk-benefit ratio. But the patient who does not consent to unnecessary daily labs drawn at 5 a.m., that person is declining phlebotomy. They are not refusing it. Next up, GOMER, or any of its variations, such as GOMED OUT. For those not familiar with it, GOMER was originally an acronym for Get Out of My ER. It was introduced into the lexicon by the book House of God, where it was used to describe a patient with chronic, severe illness, usually with significant neurologic impairments, who is frequently admitted with complex complications of their chronic illness, and who require a disproportionate amount of a resident's attention with seemingly little benefit. Now, it would be dishonest to say that this category of patient doesn't, doesn't exist, because they do. But the term GOMER has a very strongly negative connotation, implying a patient whose chronic disability and limited quality of life makes treating them not worth the effort or cost. While you may feel this way about a patient at some point during internship, which is okay to discuss with your team, it's not okay to give disrespectful and dehumanizing labels to your patients. When directly referring to your patients, use neutral language. Next, never say a patient has failed a treatment, as in, this is Mr. Brown, a 50-year-old man with lymphoma who was admitted for a clinical trial after he failed RCHOP. Patients don't fail treatments. Treatments fail patients. A term which is so obviously offensive that it's truly perplexing how commonly it's used openly, let alone used primarily by pediatricians, FLK as an acronym for funny-looking kid. It's used to describe children who have an unusual and distinctive facial appearance that is suggestive of an undiagnosed genetic or chromosomal disorder. How should you phrase this instead? I think probably the best way is, this is a child with a distinctive facial appearance, or a little bit less well, or less good, this is an unusual appearing child. Next are two closely related terms that you should never say. Patients are not wheelchair-bound. They are individuals who use a wheelchair. Likewise, avoid saying things like, Mr. Smith is a 65-year-old disabled man. And instead, rephrase it as, Mr. Smith is a 65-year-old man with chronic disability, secondary to such and such. We never want to imply that an individual is defined by their disability. 
somewhat similar to terms related to disability, is alcoholic. Don't make statements like, I've got a consult from Jen Surge about a 50-year-old alcoholic who just had a seizure. The preferred way to phrase that, you can choose to refer to the person as a 50-year-old with alcohol dependence or alcohol abuse if you happen to know which term is the most appropriate one to use for that particular patient. Or if you prefer to use the latest terminology, you could refer to the patient as a 50-year-old with alcohol use disorder. A term which is totally fine to use as intended, but can be horrifically misunderstood by a patient reading their own medical chart, is when you use SOB as an acronym for shortness of breath. For those with limited familiarity with American slang, SOB is also a term used as shorthand for son of a bitch. Instead, either write out shortness of breath or use the appropriate medical term, dyspnea. When a patient is approaching the end of their life due to chronic and or terminal illness, we don't withdraw support or withdraw care. We shift the focus of care from one with a primary curative intent to one with a primary palliative intent. Using terms like withdrawing care can conjure up images of healthcare workers literally pulling the plug on ventilators and walking away while the patient suffocates alone in an otherwise empty room. Doctors and nurses obviously know that this is not what happens, but patients and families don't all realize that. I personally believe that using the word withdrawal during family meetings to discuss end-of-life care results in some families delaying the decision to focus on palliation and initiating appropriate comfort care measures. The final one is not a single specific word or term, but rather a way of using language. Don't refer to patients as diagnoses. While it may seem harmless to say something like, I admitted two MIs and a GI bleed last night, and while I have probably myself used similar language many times before, your patients are not just walking collections of diagnoses. They are individuals who happen to have some medical problems in addition to their rich and diverse opinions, feelings, and life experiences. When you head to the ED, you are, aren't there to admit a pneumonia and a renal failure, but rather you're there to admit an individual with pneumonia and an individual with renal failure. The language we choose to use impacts how we feel about our patients and how well we can empathize with them, which then impacts how we treat them and how they view us. Being admitted to a hospital is already a scary, dehumanizing experience for many people. Any shift in the words that we use that can help mitigate that, no matter how small the effect, is worth it.